Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Sunday, July 18th, 2021. And we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. So I wanted to come on uh, for a few minutes and tell you about a online course that I teach. Some of you have maybe you heard me talk about it before and see me talk about it um, on my radio show, but I want to talk about a uh, online course that I teach. Uh, it's a 10 week online course, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. And we deal with thousands of years of history and deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Okay. So I, I want to do a, a brief overview of this online course and uh it takes place on sundays 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time we teach it on my online school so it's not here on facebook or youtube uh but you can register for the online course we'll post a link here you can register for it and all the we do the class live but all the sessions are recorded also so you can ask questions in the class with the live chat but all the sessions are recorded as well so uh, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We're going to flip over to the PowerPoint presentation. We're going to do a brief overview of this online course. And uh, you can register for it and join us in class. All right. So uh, we see history in the news every day. OK, we see history in the news every day, whether we're talking about Juneteenth, whether we're talking about um, uh, most recently. I was reading this article dealing with uh, Texas. OK, and we see. The attack on history, the attack on critical race theory, the attack on the 1619 project. But uh, if we look at this article right here from New York Times, and then I'm going to go to the uh, PowerPoint presentation here in just a second. But if we look at this article here from the New York Times, right? This is from uh, May 20th, 2021. Texas pushes to obscure the state's history of slavery and racism. Texas pushes to obscure the state's history of slavery and racism. Texas is awash in bills aimed at fending off critical examinations of the state's past, okay? Now, the reason why this is so important in, in this whole fight over the 1619 project, this whole attack on critical race theory, uh, in states, in their state legislatures, they're pushing laws to, to suppress what can be taught about systemic racism in school and slavery. Whoever controls the teaching of the past will control the trajectory of the future. Whoever controls the teaching of the past will control the trajectory of the future. And this is why the real history has to be taught in schools. Um, this is why you hear me talk about the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center, teaching hard history, American slavery, teaching hard history, American slavery, which documents how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country. And it lays out numerous uh, techniques and numerous uh, suggestions on how to more correctly teach that history. OK, so so we have this article here from the uh, New York Times. This is from May uh, 2020. OK, May uh, May 20th, 2021, I should say. And when you study the history of Texas and and I just did a show back in June dealing with uh, the Mexican-American War and dealing with uh, Texas becoming part of the Union in uh, 1845, coming into the U.S. as a, a slaveholding state. But Texas, California and New York, what is in those textbooks influences what's in the textbooks across the country. These are the three states with the largest school districts. Um, the proposal in Texas, a state that influences school curriculums, a state that influences school curriculums around the country through its huge textbook market, amount to some of the most aggressive efforts to control the teaching of American history. OK, keep in mind, whoever controls the teaching of the past will control the trajectory of the future. And they come as nearly a dozen other Republican led states seek to ban or limit how the role of slavery and pervasive effects of racism can be taught. OK, so read the rest of this article. They talk about Idaho, Louisiana, New Hampshire, Tennessee, et cetera. All right. And Louisiana, Tennessee.
Kentucky and um, uh, Texas. OK, these are all former slaveholding states and, for, and also former uh, uh, Confederate states as well. So then we look at this update to this story here. Right. And I'm going to go to the PowerPoint presentation in just a second. But we look at this update. To this story. This is from July 16th, 2021. This is from uh, uh, Bloomberg Law dot com, Bloomberg Law dot com. Texas Senate votes to remove required lessons on civil rights. Texas State Senate votes to remove required lessons on civil rights. Well, why, why would we do something like that? These people have to sit back. Is Why would they do something like that? What's, what, what's so harmful about teaching about civil rights and what's so harmful about teaching the real history of, of uh, uh, about the Civil War and slavery and things like this? Um, you also have to study the state constitutions. You also have to study the state constitutions of these various states, like the uh, Texas state constitution of 1876. And you've heard me talk about the Mississippi state constitution of 1890, which instituted poll taxes and literacy tests, things like this. Okay. So this shows us the intersection between history and law and politics. These are some, some of the things I deal with in the online course. These, this shows you the intersection between history, law, and politics. We look at this article here from the Washington post. You've heard me talk about the Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890. We came here to exclude the Negro. This is what was voted on at the Mississippi State Convention in 1890. And and Judge Solomon Saladin Calhoun, who was the uh, judge who, who was a white county judge who presided over the uh, convention. He said, let me the convention's president, Solomon Saladin Calhoun. A white county judge put the voting issue bluntly. He said, oh, let's tell the truth. If it bursts the bottom of the universe, he said, we came here to exclude the Negro. Nothing short of this will answer. Now, this is 1890. This. Th th so this is uh, 35 years after the uh, uh, Civil War ends. OK. So, so this is um, 25 years after the Civil War ends, I should say. Uh, 25 years after the Civil War ends, 1865. And African-Americans are the majority population in the, in the state of Mississippi. Delegates eventually adopted a literacy test and a poll tax geared to suppress the uh, geared to suppress the black vote in a state with a black majority. The majority of the population of Mississippi in 1890 was African-American. The Mississippi plan became the model throughout the South, part of a raft of racially oppressive Jim Crow laws that ended Reconstruction. So so what we have here, the reason why you need the civil rights movement is because of what happened with the Mississippi State Constitution. And the and the Louisiana State Constitution, 1898, Texas State Constitution, 1876, and them attacking the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment and things like this. This is why you needed a modern day civil rights movement. Right. So all this is tied to history and this is tied to politics. Politics is the legal distribution that scares wealth, power and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, their adoption, interpretation and enforcement. OK, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, their adoption, interpretation and enforcement. OK, now there's, there's one article. This, this is the article I was looking for here from The Washington Post. Show you how all this is connected. What's taking place in the state legislature? What's taking place at the school board, the school board level? OK, the attack on critical race theory, the attack on the 1619 project, trying to suppress teaching about systemic racism in schools and, and the history of slavery. All this is tied to history. The more we understand about our history and the history of this country, the better we can navigate throughout it. The better we, we will have a better understanding of who needs to be voted out of office, who needs to be put into office, the policies that need to be pushed, the policies and laws that need to be corrected. All this ties into history. 
if we look at this article here, then we'll go to the PowerPoint presentation uh, in just a second here. And I posted the link to register for this 10 week online course. We teach it on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. OK, and uh, we do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. The class is regularly one hundred thirty dollars is on sale. Eighty dollars. As soon as you register, you can start watching the archive content um, for the class we did last uh, last Sunday. And you can join us in class uh, for the next class. Um, a Texas bill drew ire for saying it would preserve purity of the ballot box. Here's the history of the phrase. because Purity of the ballot box has a racist history behind it. And that was part of the Texas state constitution of 1876. That's going to lead to things like the all white primaries in 1918 and African Americans were excluded from voting. Okay. Um, so read this article here. Uh, it was a word. It was a word choice loaded with history. The democratic lawmaker said uh, Thursday, a phrase that fueled all white primaries during the era of Jim Crow laws and justify the disenfranchisement of people deemed unfit to vote. OK, uh, but read this, read this uh, full uh, article here and research that purity of the ballot box. OK, that's and that was part of the Texas state constitution of 1876. Now, if we go and look at what just happened in Texas, OK, we go and look what just happened in Texas. This this article here is from July 16th. They're attacking. Republicans are attacking teaching about civil rights and the civil rights movement in schools. Texas Senate votes to remove required lessons on, on civil rights. This is July 16th, 2021. Now, we know that uh, 51 Democrats from the Texas House of Representatives there in Washington, D.C., they have left the state of Texas to deny Republicans a quorum so they can't vote to push through the voter restriction bill in, in, in Texas and get that signed in the law, which has a history. You got to study the history of Texas. You have to study the history of the Alamo and uh, 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 settlers from the U.S. going into Texas territory, setting up this Alamo fort, having slavery in Texas, even though Vicente Guerrero, the first black president, what is, he was the second president of Mexico, the first black president of Mexico. He was the first black president in North America. He became president in 1829 of Mexico. He was a former slave and he abolished slavery. He abolished slavery. And in the Alamo fort, the, the, the settlers from the U.S. had slaves and it's going to cause this conflict this territorial dispute and you have the battle of the Alamo. That's where Davy Crockett's going to be killed. And Jim Bowie, who cr created the Bowie knife, they're going to be killed. All this stuff. There's going to be revenge from uh, the U S and, and Sam Houston leading his charge against Santa Ana, uh, against Santa Ana's army, all of this, but Texas is going to become uh, a state in the union and Texas wins its independence from Mexico in 1836. It becomes a state in the union in 1845, then 1846 to 1848. Then you have the Mexican-American War, which is also the U.S. is fighting for land. And the U.S. ends up getting Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Utah and Nevada. All that land was Mexican territory. All that land was Mexican territory. And this deals with manifest destiny and deals with. Europeans in, in the U.S., they're trying to take over the entire North American continent. Mexico loses a third of their land after the Mexican-American War because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The U.S. buys that land for 15 million dollars. Mexico didn't want to sell the land. They lose a third of their territory. OK, behind all this territory dispute and Europeans trying to take over the entire North American continent. So if we look at this here and understand that whoever controls the teaching of the past will control the trajectory of the future. Texas Senate votes to remove required lessons on civil rights. OK, the Texas, uh, the Texas State Senate on Friday, OK, Friday, July uh, 16th. Passed legislation that would end requirements that would end requirements. At public schools, include writings on women's suffrage and the civil rights movement in social studies classes among the figures whose works would be dropped 
are Susan B. Anthony. Now, we know she was a white supremacist as well. Now, Susan B. Anthony did make amends with Frederick Douglass before he died. Frederick, Frederick Douglass dies in 1895, five years after the uh, uh, Mississippi State uh, Constitution of 1890 was signed in the law. She did make amends with him, but we know there was racism in the women's suffrage movement, but we should still study the women's suffrage movement as well. The, the, the movement of white women to vote and there were African-American women involved in that like Sojourner Truth is, as well. We still need to study that history. Okay. They, so they're talking about the, with this, with this bill that passed the Texas state Senate among the figures whose works would be dropped. Susan B. Anthony, Cesar Chavez, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose I Have a Dream speech and the letter from a Birmingham jail would no longer make the curriculum cut. And 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 the, the way even they teach the I Have a Dream speech is, is, is not really historically accurate unless they tell you that the original name of the speech was not I Have a Dream. It was originally called Normalcy Never Again. Then it was called a cancel check. And the speech was not about a dream because when you read Clarence B. Jones, the article that Clarence B. Jones wrote for the Washington Post, and he was a speech writer, he was one of the speech writers for Dr. King. He talks about how the phrase I have a dream did not appear in any of the original drafts of the speech. And the, and the speech was not a not about a dream. You go to the Library of Congress website, loc.gov and read it. You uh, you go to the uh, the King Institute at Stanford University. You look at they have the whole they have all his papers online at Stanford University that you can read, the King Institute, okay? When you read the speech, he's talking about dismantling white supremacy. He's talking about dismantling white supremacy. He calls out police brutality. He calls out discrimination and racism. He talks about Negroes moving from a smaller ghetto to a larger ghetto. He's talking about uh, black people in the South who can't vote and African-Americans in New York who feel they have nothing to vote for. He's calling out America on his on its hypocrisy. And he says, we were given a promissory note a hundred years prior with the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. And he said, when we take that promissory note to the bank and try to cash it is marked insufficient funds. He's calling America out on it, its hypocrisy. Mahalia Jackson, who was there at the march and sang two songs, Mahalia Jackson yells out, tell him about the dream, Martin, tell him about the dream. So then he shifts after he deals with the meat of the speech and then it starts, starts talking about the dream and the beloved community. But the beloved community is what happens after you dismantle white supremacy and racism. People focus on the end of the speech, but don't focus on the substance of the speech and what it was about. The speech wasn't about a dream. Is about dismantling white supremacy and racism and holding America accountable from a promissory note given to us a hundred years prior. So if we're going to teach about the speech, we need to teach correctly about the speech and we need to read the entire speech. People skip over him talking about police brutality in the speech. You can go to LOC.gov Library of Congress website and read the speech. They have the full speech there. Now, the bill SB3 which passed on a vote of 18 to four in the Texas state Senate is now stalled because the house, the Texas house of representatives cannot achieve a quorum while a breakaway group of Democrats is out of the state. Okay. Because they're fighting for the John Lewis voting rights act and the, for the people act. Okay. The, the, the Texas Democrats who left and went to Washington, D.C. to draw more attention to this issue and, and try to get support from uh, dumbass senators like Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema. Now, the special session is set to end on August 6, 2021. Now, this bill will remove more than two dozen teaching requirements from a new law, HB 3979, that bars the teaching of critical race theory. But critical race theory is not being taught in K through 12 schools. They don't teach critical race theory. That is a legal analysis taught in law schools and graduate schools in college. They don't teach critical race theory in K through 12. This is a problem looking for a solution. This is a problem looking for a solution that bars the teaching of critical race theory and academic framework exploring racism shaping another country. And just teaching history is not critical race theory. Just teaching history and history of slavery and systemic racism, that's not critical race theory. That is a legal analysis taught in law schools. The law included a list of historic figures, events and documents 
required for inclusion in social studies classes. The Senate passed bill will remove most mentions of people of color and women from those requirements. I wonder why they would do this. Now, at the same time, Texas is becoming less white as a state and more a state that, in a state that has more a growing population of African-Americans, Latinos, Asian-Americans, et cetera. Texas is becoming less white. Whoever controls the teaching of the past will control the trajectory of the future. The Senate passed bill will remove most mentions of people of color and women from those requirements, along with the requirement that students be taught about the history of white supremacy and, quote, the ways in which it, it is morally wrong. They want to remove that requirement as well, along with the requirement that students be taught about the history of white supremacy. Now, why would you remove Dr. King and I have a dream speech and a letter from a Birmingham bail, a letter from a Birmingham jail, and you also want to remove requirements that students be taught about the history of white supremacy and the ways in which it is morally wrong? The measure would also bar the teaching of the 1619 Project, a New York Times initiative exploring U.S. history starting at the date enslaved people arrived in the English colonies. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, Republican, who presides over the Senate, over the Texas State Senate, said in a statement about the vote that, quote, Senate Bill 3 will make certain that critical race philosophies, including the debunked 1619 founding myth, are removed from our school curriculums statewide, end quote. Yes, he's an old white man. Hmm. Read this, read this article. This is from July 16, 2021. This ain't from 1871. This is from 2021. Texas Senate votes to remove required lessons on civil rights. Huh. I guess they don't teach about Malcolm X either, right? I guess it's safe to say, if you don't want to teach about Dr. King, I guess it's safe to assume that you don't teach about Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, Kwame Ture, huh? So let's let's look at this overview of, the, of this online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history, what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, understand why this history is so important. The history and politics intersect. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, palm resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, the adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. We understand that uh, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you've been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So this is uh, this class is ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. It started out as a lecture that I did January 24, 2015, a four and a half hour lecture. It's about seven years of research. It's evolved to a 10 week online course that I teach. And I do radio six days a week here in Detroit, Monday through Fridays, 11 p.m. to midnight. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. So um, and whenever I speak, I know I may say some things that are outside the circumference of some people's awareness. So I usually uh, say something like this. The space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Everything I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there's still things that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness. So I learned this from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagan's. Uh, the African Village. We look at some other articles very quickly here. Recent articles. This is from February 2021. Mock slave auctions, racist lessons, how U.S. history class often traumatizes, dehumanizes black students. Then we look at this one here. February. Let's see. That's that was March 4th, 2021. This is February 10th, 2021. USA Today. Other one was USA Today as well. Republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 Project. OK, Nicole Hannah Jones, even though there are some problems with the 1619 project it's flawed, there's still some good things that can be taught. I think it could be corrected. The whole thing should be attacked. 
We talk about Juneteenth. You've seen some of my presentations on Juneteenth. 60% of Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth. And, and, and what African Americans know about Juneteenth, a lot of that is false also. That deals with understanding history. This is from the New York Times. Most Americans know little or nothing about Juneteenth poll fines. Okay, this is teaching hard history of American slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center. This is one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, who teaches us whoever controls the images controls your self-esteem, self-respect, and self-development. Whoever controls the history controls the future. Uh, let's look at this here. Okay, so uh let's look quickly here at a brief overview of some of the things we deal with in the online course so we deal with understanding what the trans transatlantic slave trade was events that take place we deal with ancient egypt ancient kemet africa Nile valley region of africa uh nubia Tanahesi, ethiopia all, all that okay uh what were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting what role did christopher columbus play in the transatlantic slave trade when did africans first come to the u.s as slaves did africans sell themselves into slavery we deal with that complicated history uh uh when uh were african people in america before the transatlantic slave trade that's extremely important uh we deal with uh christopher columbus we deal with christopher columbus who on his four voyages uh columbus on his four voyages uh, we see him going into Cuba and Haiti and Jamaica, Puerto Rico, Honduras, Panama, all those areas. And we just see we see Haiti and um, Cuba um, as well as Jamaica. OK, we see them in the news right now. Uh, the assassination of uh, President Jovenel Moise. You see, you see me talk about that. We see the protests in Cuba uh uh taking place now and also jamaica is preparing a petition to uh petition britain for about 10 billion dollars in reparations okay because we know that uh jamaica was a colony jamaica was colonized by the british and when we look at where columbus went on his four voyages this is why columbus is so important to understanding the spread of the transatlantic slave trade. Now he did not create the transatlantic slave trade. We see it going back to 1441 uh, with the Portuguese, but we have to understand thousands of years of history that lead up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. The 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And then we see with Columbus, Columbus helps to lay the foundation for the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade and the exploitation of indigenous people and the uh, um, expansion of, and he helps to lay the foundation for racism and capitalism, things like this. He helps to helps, helps that expand. But August 3rd, 1492, he set sail on the Nina Nepenta and the Santa Maria. Now, 1492 is the same year that the Moors lose control of their last stronghold in Spain, which was Granada, January 2nd, 1492. And this is part of the Reconquista, which is the reconquest of uh, taking back the uh, territories that the Moors occupied. The, the uh, re uh, Reconquista starts in 722 A.D. And we see these tensions, these conflicts between the African Moors and and these Europeans, especially in Spain and Portugal, things like this. Um, he goes uh, Columbus goes into uh, the Bahamas, which he calls San Salvador. He goes into Cuba and the Hispaniola. This is 1492. And the western portion of the island of Hispaniola, the British are going to take the the, uh, the the French are going to take control of that. And it's going to be called St. Dominique. And then this is where the Haitian Revolution is going to take place, 1791 to 1804. OK, so that's the western portion of this island of Hispaniola where Haiti is. OK, so you see this 1492, then 1493, 1494, Columbus goes into the West Indies. He goes into uh, Bariquin, which is Puerto Rico and Jamaica for 1494. The Spanish conquer these areas. Cuba, uh, uh, Jamaica and Haiti were originally conquered by Columbus and the Spanish. And what's taking place now, we, we are still feeling the effects of what happened over 500 years ago with Columbus and his four voyages. 
and and he was doing this on behalf of the Spanish crown, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, is going to be their grandson, Emperor Charles V, in 1518, who's going to sign the Asiento de Negros, which is the license coming from Spain, giving that to European nations to provide the Spanish colonies with slaves. And this is African slaves. And this is going to really help the transatlantic slave trade to expand and increases the demand for African slaves. Uh, third voyage, May 1498, Trinidad and Venezuelan mainland in South America. Fourth voyage, May 1504, Panama and Honduras in Central America. Now, Columbus never came to the land we call the United States of America. I know they have statues and busts and things like this of Columbus. He never came to this land. Closest he came here is Cuba, which is which is 90 miles away. And one of the things they're setting up on these um, in these colonies, in these Caribbean colonies, are plantations, sugarcane plantations. OK, which which was which, which is a huge industry, sugarcane plantations. OK. So these are just a few of the things that we deal with in the online course. Uh, also, we'll do we deal with um, and this is on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. Uh, you can use this also with your children. I would say it's it's um, I would say it's PG-13. I don't do a lot of cursing and it's not vulgar and. Um, because we deal with slavery, you know, things like this, we have to deal with some unpleasant topics, of course, but it's, it, I would say it's PG-13. Um, and we do the class live, all the sessions are recorded. So as soon as you register, you can start, you can uh, watch uh, last Sunday's class. And then also the Saturday course that I'm teaching, that's wrapping up. So uh, you get classes one through 10 archived of the Saturday course that you can watch as well of, of the same class. Some other things we deal with in the, in the course, uh, we deal with the 800, the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. Uh, two of the books that I use in the class. So I ref, we have a PowerPoint presentation. We have about 50 articles that we reference as a timeline of history going back five million years that I use, but I also reference books. Now you don't have to feel obligated to buy any of these books. Okay. You don't have to buy any of these books. You can if you want to. This is one of them, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. And uh, I'm looking for my other, oh, this other one here by my friend Ronoko Rashidi, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe. Okay, so these are two of the books that I use in the class. Uh, it's about 10 um, that I use. This is another one. This is a symbols encyclopedia, a symbols dictionary, symbols, signs and symbols, an illustrated guide to their origins and meanings. Africa is on the front. You see the metal netter. Africa is on the back. You see the caduceus, which comes out of ancient Kemet, the uh, universal symbol of medicine. Um, you see the ankh on the back as well. OK, the African symbol for eternal life. Uh, this is a. Another book that I use, this is volume one, um, African-American chronology, 1492 to 1972. This is volume one. And this is also one that I use in a second course that I teach a, a new 10 week course that's about to start up. That's going to start up the new one. That is a, this is going to be a second 10 week course that I'm going to do that picks up where ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa leaves off. This new course that, that's going to start up um, Saturday, July 24th, it's going to start up. The new one is going to deal with history from 1865 through 1965 up until about 1968 and the assassination of Dr. King and the Black Power Movement 1966. We're going to go through and analyze a 10 year period of time of history each class. OK, so that one, that that new one. That is going to pick up with this course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade with the Den Teacher in School, where this course leads off. That that new one is going to uh, that is uh, uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power. OK, uh, so that's that one is going to start up um, July 24th. All right. Uh, Saturday, July 24th. So. 
uh, that's something to look forward to as well. So if you if you're already in this class, this 10 week class, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, or you've taken it before, this new class is going to blow you away because now we'll be able to zero in each class and spend about two hours analyzing approximately a 10 year period of time of history going from the end of slavery. 40 acres and the mule special field order number 15, uh, 15 Juneteenth. 13th Amendment. 1865 through Reconstruction, Jim Crow era, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, Grandfather Clause, 1898, World War One, 1914 and 1918, Great Migration, 1915 and 1970, 1970, Red Summer, 1919, there were 25 major race riots in the country, Tulsa Race Massacre, 1921, Rosewood, 1923. We'll be able to study all that history. Emmett Till, August 28th, 1955. Montgomery bus boycott, December 5th, 1955. Tuskegee, Alabama economic boycott that lasted four years, four, four times as long as the Montgomery bus boycott, 1957 to 1961. SNCC being founded August, May, 1960. SCLC, 1957. Dr. King's house being firebombed twice in 1956 during the Montgomery bus boycott. Civil rights movement, black power movement will be able to analyze a 10 year period of time, each class. That's going to be a fantastic class also. All right. So in this one here, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, which is a precursor to, uh, from civil, from the civil war to civil rights and black power. It's a precursor to this class to, to the new class. Uh, some of the other things we deal with here, are shocking archaeological discoveries that are that are causing experts to rethink everything. When these, you know, we deal with a number of different archaeological discoveries. We talked about this last week, like um, uh, out of Mesopotamia, I'm sorry, out of Morocco, June of 2017, uh, they found uh, rem uh, remains of of uh, Homo sapiens dating back 300,000, 350,000 years ago. And the oldest fossils or remains of Homo sapiens they had before that were found in Ethiopia uh, that date back about 195,000 years ago. And the archaeologists are saying this is causing us to have to rethink everything. They have to push the timelines back. They realize all this stuff is older than what we thought. They're new, they're, there's new technology. There's these new archaeological discoveries coming out every other week. OK, uh, we do with insurance companies that took out policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on the plantations like the Nautilus Life Insurance Company founded in spring of 1845 in Manhattan. And then they, they're going to change their name to the New York Life Insurance Company. In their first three years, they take out about 500 insurance policies on enslaved Africans on on plantations. And there were at least 262 skills, trades and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. And uh, these skills, trades and crafts are going to be used to build this country. OK, we did more than just cook the food uh, and 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 wash clothes and, and pick cotton. OK, uh, there's this book from. that came out in 1978 by uh, James Newton and um, Ronald Lewis called The Other Slaves, Mechanics, Artisans and Craftsmen, The Other Slaves mechanics, artisans, and craftsmen. And this deals with the, uh, they list 262 skills, trades, and crafts that we had in this country. Many of these skills we're bringing with us from Africa. We were anchor makers and artists and bakers and barrel makers and bartenders and basket makers and beer makers and blacksmiths and bricklayers and brick makers and cabinet makers, cigar makers, cooks, coppersmiths, decorative furnishers, fishermen, engineers, gardeners, hemp baggers, herb doctors, horse trainers, hunters, locksmiths. We were also jockeys, though also. So when we studied the Kentucky Derby, First ran 1875, 13 of the 15 jockeys, some sources say 14 of the 15 jockeys were African-American men. Many of them former slaves. The, 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 the winner of the first Kentucky Derby was an African-American man named Oliver Lewis. He was 19 years old. We dominated horse racing. 
we dominate a horse racing and there was a concerted effort by white men to push us out of horse racing because they got jealous of the type of money we were making. As long as we were making money for them when we were slaves, it was all right. When slavery ends and now we can make money for ourselves, even though we have white sponsors and things like this, but now we're more in control. We can make money for ourselves. Now it's a problem. So the last African-American winner of the Kentucky Derby was Jimmy Wink Wingfield in 1902. So we deal with, we deal with these types of topics. We deal with ancient Africa, African civilizations, Ghana, Songhai, Mali. Uh, we do a Freemasonry, America and the founding fathers because because the Moors are taking the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into Europe. And, and these teachings are going to bring Europe out of the dark ages, unfortunately, to our detriment. We see the Moors going in 711 AD. They're taking things like chemistry or what, 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 or what they called alchemy. They're taking the periodic tables They're introducing new foods, musical instruments, introducing new ways to make swords and make weapons, all different types of things like this. They're introducing treaties to uh, they're introducing um, writings on how to make uh, surgical instruments. OK, and they're teaching freely those who want to learn. Uh, these types of teachings are going to the, the, the Moors and the Arabs are going to build the University of Salamanca in Spain around 1285, 1286 A.D. OK, really the first university there in Spain. Other universities, universities of Toledo and Bologna and Naples, Oxford University, they're going to study the teachings that the Moors are introducing into Europe. All the everything we taught them came back to kick us in the behind. And we see we we see this is going to lead to the transatlantic slave trade. This is why I say when we look at this stuff chronologically. Because, see, the way that it's taught in school, I mean, when I was in Wayne State University and African studies classes, the way they teach it, they start oftentimes in 15th century, mid 15th century. And they make it seem like when the Portuguese go into Mauritania and, and we see the Spanish uh get involved in the transatlantic slave trade right after the portuguese they make it seem like this is the first contact they, these europeans have had with african people outside of greece and rome and alexander the greek going into egypt invading egypt and things like this outside of that they make it seem like this is the first time no the, the, the moors were all throughout europe they're all throughout europe they're in austria and czechoslovakia and germany things like this they're all throughout europe intermixing with the european culture also not just changing european culture but changing the complexion of Europeans because African Moors are intermixing into the European culture as well, changing their complexion, especially in Spain and Portugal. So when we really look at this chronology of history, the transatlantic slave trade is really Europeans getting revenge on Africans for what was happening in Europe and these conflicts between these Moors and Europeans. It, and it's not just something that just fell out of the sky. There's a pretext for this. They were already dealing with these Africans. They knew who they were. It wasn't just, just something that 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 it, there was conflict. Now, I don't think anybody knew that it was going to explode, you know, over the course of time to what it eventually evolved to. But there was conflict between them. It wasn't like just something that just, oh, we don't we don't know what happened. We don't we don't know how these we don't we we don't know how these laws just manifested. No, that wasn't. There's was a pretext to this. OK. Let's continue. So we deal with the uh, origins of the term America, Africa and more Freemasonry, America and the founding fathers. Uh, the problem with slave movies, why are we being bombarded with slave movies and slave TV, sh slave themed TV shows, even though slavery is part of our history, when they deal with these a lot of these movies, they don't put this in the proper historical context either and don't deal with the African presence in this country going back tens of thousands of years. And um, uh, there's a lack of TV shows dealing with other aspects of our history and movies, especially dealing with ancient Africa. If you can make Black Panther, when Black Panther was a fantastic movie, I mean, I've done a three hour lecture done with the film Black Panther. Black Panther incorporates African history and culture and and 11 different African cultures, uh, spiritual systems, Bastet, Bast, the Panther deity, that comes from Bastet in ancient Kemet. 
That's Bastet was a netter, one of the deities. So the, it's a powerful movie. But if you can create Black Panther, you can create movies about the Ghana Song High and Mali and Mansa Musa and uh, 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 Amenhotep the Third and Queen T. And you can do, do do movies about ancient Nubia, ancient Africa, ancient Kemet, all that stuff. If you can do Black Panther, you can do those other movies. We talk about Osar, Osset, and Heru and the origins of the Immaculate Conception story. That goes back thousands of years in ancient Africa. And when we study Europeans in Europe, they were worshiping the black Madonna and child before they decolorized uh, the Virgin Mary. They, they were worshiping the black Madonna and child, which comes from Osar, Osset, and Heru. Be, be, before they decolorized her, because see what, what we're going to see is, and we deal with this in the class, this is why we take you throughout history, right? What we see is as Europeans are coming out of the dark ages, conquering people's lands, extracting wealth to rebuild Europe, because Europe, as Dr. John Henry Clark correctly teaches us, was land poor, people poor, and resource poor. poor. They, Europe had lost uh, one quarter to a third of their population due to the Black Death, the bubonic plague that hits in 1347 AD and hits in 1347 to 1400. Europe loses somewhere between 25 million to 75 million people. OK. And they're and they're rebuilding. They're trying to rebuild Europe. They're trying to expel the Moors as well. And as they're conquering people's land, they start to they start to rebuild and gain more power. OK. As this is taking place there, they are expelling the Moors. Some of the Moors are being enslaved, things like this. They're setting the Europeans are setting up these colonies in Cuba and Jim in, in Jamaica and Hispaniola, etc. You start having a rise in the European phenotype, a rise in the dominance of, of the European phenotype. So figures, images that were traditionally depicted as African get reinterpreted as European. One of them was the black Madonna and child. Okay. Uh, because Europeans, you go back hundreds of years, Europeans, or even before then, Europeans were practic practically worshiping African people. But we see all, we, we're going to see all this change in the, we see it really change in the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. We see all this stuff get twisted around. Um, if we look at, let's see here. Let me go back to the part because we have um, uh, a saw and I'll set in here. And I'll show you some images. Uh, we do a links to ancient Kemet, uh, Egypt. Uh, Kemet one of the, being one of the original names for Egypt. Kemet meaning the land of the blacks. Links to ancient Kemet and early Christianity. All right. And the story of the the virgin birth and the immaculate conception and the adoration. That's an ancient African story before Christianity is created. But then we deal with Christ, Christ meaning anointed or anointed one coming from Christos, which is Greek Christos coming from the comedic Ka rest, which means the rising of the spirit K A R S T Ka meaning spirit rest, meaning to rise. These are African uh, concepts that get Europeanized. These are African concepts that get Europeanized. This is why to understand what is, you have, you have to understand what was. So if we, let me pull this up here. Um, we, so we deal with uh, Freemasonry in America, the fake Willie Lynch letter 1712, because Willie Lynch never historically, historically existed. And the Willie Lynch letter is proven to be a fraud. I've interviewed Professor Menu and Pym from Contra Costa College. We dealt with that in depth. Uh, the African influence in the film Black Panther, which is a fantastic movie. And for the research on Black Panther and the lectures I've done on Black Panther, one, I read about 100 articles dealing with the film Black Panther and um, uh, the Black Panther comic book. Two, I had to. I spent about three months researching. Doing research on the film Black Panther. Uh, this is 
this is one book I read dealing with the history of the Black Panther comic book. This book deals with the 52 year history of the Black Panther comic book because I had to study that and understand how Black Panther fits into the Marvel comic universe and understand these characters and storylines and things like this, because we see a lot of that reflected in the movie. So this is for Marvel, Black Panther, the ultimate guide. I had to read this book. And this, I mean, this is a fantastic book here dealing with uh, the Black Panther comic book and all these characters and storylines and uh, all that stuff that we see. I mean, in the, in the film where uh, Killmonger, who comes from the comic book, now they changed the, they changed the storyline dealing with Killmonger because in the comic book, Killmonger is 100 percent Wakandan in the um, in the movie. He is half Wakandan, half African American. They changed that storyline most likely to resonate more with an African American uh, audience. And we see the movie opens in Oakland, California, and ends in Oakland, California, which is a reference to the Black Panther Party for Self Defense, founded in October 1966 in Oakland, California. Okay, so uh, when when Killmonger throws uh, T'Challa off of the waterfall. That waterfall is called Warrior Falls. Warrior Falls is where the ritual combat takes place uh, to see who's going to sit on the throne of Wakanda. All right. And, you know, th that that comes uh, straight out of the comic books. That's uh, from Jungle Action comic books. I think that was 1973. That's Jungle Action um, uh, comic books. But that comes that scene is uh, straight out the comic books. You know, so there were 11 different African cultures that we see uh, referenced in the movie. Uh, everything coming from the uh, coming from Namibia and uh, Nigeria and Ethiopia, uh, et cetera. So it's a, it's a deep film on on. Um, it's a deep movie on multiple levels. So we talk about the film Black Panther as well. And then the language that's spoken in the film Black Panther is Isikosa. Isikosa is a Bantu language, just like Kiswahili is a Bantu language. And then the word Wakanda, we know the word Wakanda is a Native American uh, term. Uh, we see that in the Omaha, uh, Ponca, and Sioux Indian languages. Uh, Wakanda, which means possesses secret powers. Wakanda is a real word. But it's also a Bantu word as well, uh, Wakanda also. And let me see here, which one was that? Oh yeah, uh, September nineteen seventy three, Jungle Action comic book number six, right? Um, where he gets thrown off, where Killmonger throws T'Challa off the waterfall at Warrior Falls. Okay. That was in 1973 Jungle Action Comic Books, um, uh, issue number six, September 1973. So, and then this other book here, I had to read to understand the movie and be able to do talk intelligently about the movie and do lectures. Some people didn't do this preparation. It was this book here from Marvel, Black Panther, the official movie special. Black Panther, the official movie special. And this has interviews with the cast and director, Ron Coogler, and things like this gives background information on the film. So it was deep research I had to do to be able to uh, talk about the film and do lectures. Once again, some people were putting information I ain't didn't do no research, but okay. Um, so this class, once again, we teach, I, I teach this on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Uh, if you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, it's on the home page of the website. We posted the link here, but it's also on the home page uh, of the website. And you scroll down the home page. We have the information there. Uh, click on register here. Click on register here. And we see the flyer. It takes you to the next page and click on enroll. As soon as you enroll, you can start watching the content. All right. Uh, class is regularly $130. It's on sale $80. It's on sale $80. I do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. 
you still have access to the class even after the class is over with. so next year you can go back and watch the entire uh course offering you, it's archived uh, you will also get as a bonus you'll get the um as a bonus you'll get the lecture that i did uh july uh june 16th dealing with uh the real history of juneteenth it's a two and a half hour lecture uh you get that in digital download format you get that as a bonus uh for registering uh for this 10-week online course uh some of the other things i deal with in the class the fourth uh when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade we know that uh we're dealing with the forced journey of african people from europe to africa to the americas um trinkets from europe exchange for africans or used uh or, or they use money to purchase them uh it lasts from roughly 14, 1440s to 1865 and let me see something here i wanted to show you uh so we talk about the middle passage and what it was um i wanted to uh, we deal with Dr. David M. Hotep's work. So we also had guest speakers in the class. Dr. David M. Hotep was one of my guest speakers. Uh, my Saturday class, he spoke to the Saturday class, June 12th. When you register for this online course, you would get archive content and you get the interview that I did with, I mean, you'll get Dr. Uh, the session where Dr. David M. Hotep spoke to our class also. Uh, he wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. And uh, this book came out in 2011. His book deals with the African presence in the Americas dating back uh, at least 51,700 years ago. Um, on page 14 of his book, he deals with uh, a discovery in made in 2004 in Allendale County, South Carolina by Dr. Albert Goodyear. Dr. Albert Goodyear is an archeologist at the University of South Carolina. Um, at this campsite in Allendale County, South Carolina, they found 13 different types of evidence, 13 different types of evidence, fairly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. Now, since then, uh, actually in, in the class where uh, Dr. David M. Hotep spoke, he talked about a discovery made in the last couple of years in, in Mexico that shows an African presence going back at least 250,000 years ago. OK, so he, he when he spoke to my class, he talked about that discovery. But this one here is in South Carolina, dates back at least 51,700 years ago. Here's what they found. They found artifacts, architectures, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, genetic M174D haploid group dealing with DNA and genetics linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeletons, structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence dating back at least 51,700 years ago. Now, this is before Native Americans came into existence. Okay, this is before Native Americans came into existence. This is why the first Americans were Africans. And even if you look at the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary and you look up the word American, they tell you that an Amer that uh, American applied to the uh, was the term used by Europeans to describe the Aboriginal and copper colored races of the Americas. OK, so what this means is that the term American originally did not apply to Europeans. It applied to African people and Native Americans because this is who uh, Europeans found when they got here. All right. So even when we use the term American. And American has to do with citizenship. Even when we have to use that term, we deal with the origins of that term. We and we have to understand well who were who were the original Americans. Okay, this causes us to ask questions and do more research and say, well, wait a second, who were the original Americans? And if we look at the uh, in, in the eighteen twenty eight Noah Webster dictionary is online. You can research that. But any dictionary. Just look up the word American and the etymology of it. And it, it, it will usually tell you something to the effect that it was referring to who was here before Europeans got here. But uh, the word American, uh, a native of America, originally, this is from the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary, originally applied to the aboriginals or copper colored races 
found here by the Europeans, but now applied to the descendants of Europeans born in America. So it's telling you that the American did not originally part of Europeans. This is once again why the first Americans were African people. We are the original Americans. This is, I'm not trying to take anything away from Native Americans. We know they were here before Europeans. But the people who we call Native Americans are the offspring of an intermixing of Africans who were here for tens of thousands of years and uh, Asians who come here around 3000 B.C. And they're going to intermix in their offspring are who oftentimes are called Native Americans. But it's also important to understand that you have groups of African people who are here who are going to be relabeled as Native Americans also by European settlers, by European colonizers, whatever term you may want to use. You're going to have groups of African people who are here who get relabeled as Native American. Uh, and then we look here at uh, this article from ScienceDaily.com. ScienceDaily.com is a scientific website. They have scientific discoveries there, things like that. They have an article from 2004 about Dr. Albert Goodyear and his discovery. OK, and this is a summary of the discovery. Now, the name of the article is New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 50, Years Ago. New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. Um, the, the, here's a synopsis or, or a summary of the article. It says radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Well, who were these humans? 50,000 years ago, that's before Native Americans come into existence. And that's before, that's before the oldest uh, settlement uh, in, uh, in North America, which is the Clovis culture settlement found in, uh, New Mexico that they say dates back to about 13,000 years ago. This discovery here blows the Clovis culture, uh, uh, settlement out of, out of the water. So who were these people? These were the Khoisan who come from Southern Africa, go all around the world, have the oldest DNA on the planet that the ancestors said I knew in the Twa, and they were here in this land. This is who this was. Um, New York Times had a good article from February 2010 on on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. They talk about stone tools found on the Greek island of Crete over the course of two summers. These stone tools date back 100, 130,000 years ago, but Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years. Okay. These discoveries are blowing everything out the water and causing the archaeologists and the paleontologists and the scientists to have to rethink everything. Now, lastly, there was a, um, where is that? Uh, on the show. Yeah. I'll set. Okay. We'll go here. Slide 55. Cause I have over a hundred slides here. Um, we'll go to slide 55. Da, 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 da. And we see, um, even when you have the founding fathers, many of them are Freemasons here in this country. And we see the Moors taking the teachings from ancient Kim and ancient Egypt into Europe. And it's going to come back to this land, a lot of those teachings watered down in the form of Freemasonry. But when we look at this right here, the Washington Monument, that's a Tekken comes straight out of ancient Kim and ancient Egypt, symbol of resurrection from the story of a Saul set in Heru. There are about 1,200 Tekkenu throughout ancient Kemet. Today, they're only about somewhere around 12. Um, and when we look at Freemasonry, we see the word Mason is derived from the Latin word, Latin words mass and sun. Uh, Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify 
first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, of ancient Egypt. OK, and we, we, we're going to see these teachings. End up in Europe. OK, we're going to see a lot of these teachings end up in Europe to our detriment. This is all this stuff is going to come back to kick us in the behind once again, as I said. OK, this is why I said I, I wish we had never taught them because all and when we study what happened in Europe, we're going to see how all this comes back to kick us in the behind. Um, but we're going to see this information end up in Freemasonry. OK, it's going to be watered down, but, yeah, we, we're going to see it end up in Freemasonry. And. We're going to see it come to this land. OK, and we see it in symbols. Also, we see we see it in symbols like the tech and the Washington Monument. And we know that George Washington was a Freemason. OK, as well. Um, so. All right, let's continue here. Um, All right, so the term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet. Many Masonic temples were modified after the temples of, of Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees, okay? And historically, um, light is associated with knowledge and when we talk about Europe being in the dark ages, it was in the era and it was in a period of time of ignorance. It was in a period of time of ignorance. And the and the and the Moors are taking the light from ancient Africa knowledge into Europe, bringing Europe out of the dark ages. And the next age going into the 1500s, the next age in Europe is, is called the Renaissance area, the Renaissance period. And it's a period of enlightenment, enlightenment. Once again, now light being associated with knowledge. They're coming out of the dark ages into the Renaissance age, a period of enlightenment. If you read Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder, which is another book we use in the class, uh, pages 18 to 32, Browder breaks all this down. Browder's a friend of mine as well. I've interviewed him a number of times. Uh, he has some really good information. Now Valley Contributions of Civilization is another book that I use from Browder. Uh, 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence and 13 of the 13, uh, uh, 13 of the 39 signers of the U.S. Constitution were Freemasons. Uh, four of the first five presidents and uh, were Freemasons and 14 presidents in all have uh, uh, been Freemasons. Now, this is one of the famous statues of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, the first Holy Trinity. And Heru was born on December 25th, okay? Uh, and this is how we get Isis, Aset. Aset means she of throne, but uh, the Greeks called her Isis, and this is how we get the, 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 the Secrets of Isis uh, cartoon, I mean, TV show from DC Comics in the 1970s. Used to come on Saturday morning, the Shazam and Isis hour. I used to watch it. And they I think uh, a few years ago, they had episodes of the Secrets of, Secrets of Isis on Hulu. And when you watch it, they tell you in the, in the uh, trailer of it, the, 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 when it comes on, they tell you that she gets her powers from ancient Egypt. They don't show any African people. But they tell you she gets her powers from ancient Egypt and they talk about Hathor and they start naming these, these deities, these Neturu, things like this. So we just saw this white woman flying through the air and her name is Isis. And they say, OK, she gets her powers from Egypt, but they ain't talk about African people. They just co-opted it, just cultural appropriation. Some people is lying also, but it's cultural appropriation. OK, this is what they're doing. And then as we go from Osset and Heru to the Black Madonna and Child that was worshipped all throughout Europe and they have they still have statues of the Black Madonna and Child today in Russia and in Poland and in places like this, France. They're worshipping African people. They're worshipping the African woman. And then as you have a rise in the European phenotype, you have a rise in European powers. They start to 
to colonize this imagery. And then we get the white Mary and Jesus. They start to colonize the imagery and decolorize it. OK, all right. So these are some of the things we deal with in the online course, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Um, if you visit. So we posted the link here. You can register for it. It's a 10 week online course. We deal with thousands of years of history. We do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch them over and over again. They're archived. Uh, you can ask questions in class. Also, we have a live text chat. You can see me. I can't see you. You can be in there in your pajamas, whatever. You can have a bonnet on. So, I mean, you don't have to worry about it. It's not like Zoom where you can see everybody and you see the whole class. You know, it's not like that. Uh, you can see me. We have a live text chat. You can ask questions and um, or you can email me your questions also. But if you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, you scroll down, you'll see the information for our online course. C click on register here. It takes you to the next page. And click on enroll. As soon as you register, you can start watching the course content. All right. OK, uh, we'll post a link here. Also, and if you have any questions, you can uh, email me as well. Uh, AHN show at African History Network dot com. AHN show at African History Network dot com. And then you'll also get the bonus of the uh, digital download of the uh, two and a half hour lecture I did dealing with the real history of Juneteenth also with this uh, with this class as well. All right. So hopefully you like this type of information. Be sure to follow us here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Uh, turn on live notifications so when we go, so you know when we go live. If you like this video, click on the thumbs up. Uh, uh, as well, click on the like, cl click on the thumbs up, give us a heart and we'll see you in class. Uh, remember right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace.